my name is Amar Jyot Singh and I'm talking to Rahul uh, from Canada. Uh, he was a foreign student here. He came on a regular visa, but later he had some immigration problems. Let's find out what those problems are and uh, see if we can learn something about it. And maybe other people can take advantage of avoiding those mistakes. Uh, Rahul, uh, hello, how are you? Can you hear me uh, uh, okay? Anybody, it, it's pretty clear. Okay, good. Uh, tell me, Rahul, uh, uh, when did you, you came uh, from India on a study visa, when did you complete your uh, program? When did you graduate from your college? So, but you precisely, I graduated on May 15th, 2019. May 15th, uh, 2019, you graduated from a two-year uh, degree or what, what course was this? Uh, it was Associate of Science. It's a two-year degree. Right. Two year degree. So you were you were looking to uh, get a three year work permit and then work and then apply for a PR eventually. That's what you were looking to do, right? Right. So uh, many people know that uh, students get to apply for post graduation work permit within six months of uh, getting a written confirmation from the college uh, that they have met the requirements of completing their program of study. So you were uh, looking to apply for the PG work permit uh, starting from May. 16, so May, June, July, August, September, October, till, so you could have applied till uh, November of, November 15th, 2019, right. you could have successfully made an application for postgraduate work permit and would have been successful, but you did not, that did not happen. So what, what really happened? How did you apply for the work permit? And uh, can you tell me on what date? All right, so the, the first time when I applied for my work permit, I mean the postgraduate work permit was in May, 16, 2019. So I applied it by myself and I did a small mistake that was like I wasn't able to upload my transcripts. And then I got a, uh, a notification from IRCC via email that I need to upload my transcripts and they gave me a time period of seven days. Okay, hang and on, hang I, on, hang on. We have to go slow here. So, uh, so uh, the, the requirements of the requirements of the PG work permit applications are pretty simple. Uh, they they require, and it's clearly listed on the website, that it's not a mystery. So they require that the person who's applying for the work permit must have the, must have the study permit valid. Right. Uh, it must be valid, of course, you, you are, you are, it was valid for this. And you must have received uh, like an official letter uh, from your school that you have met the requirements of completing the program of study. Uh, right. And so uh, you, you forgot to upload the final letter from the college or the transcripts from the college or both? The transcripts, only the transcripts. I uploaded every single thing. I uploaded my graduation letter. I uploaded everything but my transcripts. Okay, so this is this this uh, is likely a serious uh, fatal uh, error that without the final transcripts, the immigration has no clue. I mean, what did you study or is it really completing the requirements? Even though you may have a letter from the college registrar that you have completed. So they gave you an uh, they gave you a chance to upload the transcripts and and what date did they give you a chance? What when did you receive the request? So I received their request on 21st of August and they gave me a time period of 7 days. That's a week. So okay. from 21st of August to 28th of August. So 21st of August on 2019 they asked you to upload uh, the upload the thing and then uh, it probably came in your online system and you got a request uh, by email, so you forgot to upload. What happened? So, I mean, there was there was just a small mis uh, misunderstanding out there again. Like I uploaded my transcripts, but they were never submitted. Like there was there was like one step further ahead of submitting it. So, like the moment I uploaded my transcripts, I thought I, it was done, but I was also supposed to submit them. So that was something that I missed it. Okay, so you. You uploaded it, but it it was not successfully submitted. How how could that happen? I'm trying to understand. You know, on an online system, you upload it, and you I know, I know. you forgot to submit. What I mean, how? Explain to me how how did that technical error happen? Honestly, sorry for my language, but it was a pretty stupid mistake. That's what I consider it to be because it was like I never looked it further. Like I mean, the, when you scroll all the way down, it gives you uh, gives you an option to submit. So. When the uploading was done, I thought it, that was it. Like that was the last step. So once oh, it's done, that's yeah. it. So I thought like if the GCP, like if since it has been uploaded, it's on my account, they'd be able to see it. But in order for them to see it, they were, I was supposed to submit it first so that they could see it. I never submitted it. 
did you take did you take did you consider taking help from a counselor in your college or somebody like an immigration lawyer or somebody at the time no i uh not at the moment like i mean i i thought like i was pretty clear like how to do it but that was uh, I, i was just being naive like this okay so it was uh, it was not submitted that was the uh, you got so you had a uh, time from august 21 till august uh, 28 and it was not submitted and and what happened what was the fine uh, the the following uh, letter from the immigration about this application so like in a nutshell they pretty much told me like i mean your postcard work permit has has been refused because uh IRCC did send you an email regarding like the transcripts like regarding the missing transcripts and they gave you a time period of 7 days but you never submitted them so now like since you have never since you didn't uh, submit it you have to apply for the registration because my visa and my study permit they both expired on 31st of July so i was pretty much on my implied status okay wait 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 a second wait a second uh, uh, you you received the letter uh, in the mail from the immigration on what date what was the date of the letter Sep- september 3 okay and and uh, and it said also that you are in implied status your application is refused but they also asked you perhaps to apply for restoration of status is that right right so at the bottom of my refusal letter it said like since your status has been since your legal status has been expired it, it expired on september 3rd there was in flight status so since it has been expired you got to apply for the restoration of your legal status for the restoration of legal status you got 90 days like i mean got the time period of 90 days yeah yeah so september so that you know october november december till december 3rd you could have applied for restoration of status right uh, and uh, and then that would have been uh, okay so now here's uh, here's the problem here that you know when they ask you to apply for restoration of status the restoration of status only means that you pay extra $200 and get back to active status uh, but what what status will you go in because your study is over your study permit is over your studies is over your study visa expired and now right. if you have to go to restoration status you will go back to the visitor status you will not not go back to the student status that's what i i think because to get back to the study permit status you need another uh, admission course or admission letter or something for the following course which is not in your case so i i i don't think um, restoration would have solved the problem because restoration would just make you legal but it would not have given you uh given you the opportunity to qualify for pg work permit because to apply for pg work permit uh, there are four requirements you must hold a valid study permit at the time of application which restoration would not have given you unless i'm wrong so i i hope somebody can correct me and uh, the second requirement is they have completed a program study which you did uh you met the requirements of working off campus without work permit so that's not a problem here uh and you did not exceed the allowable hours of work under uh, under regulation 186b so restoration would have given you legal status but not would have uh, been uh, you know you would not have been able to uh, to actually get the post graduate work permit so but uh, what did you do you went to a consultant i think uh, on after september 3rd and you went to a consultant and you asked the consultant to to allow you to uh, apply for restoration is that right right so i pretty like i was i was pretty confused what to do because i had no idea about the restoration so i thought like instead of taking any more chances on myself i rather hire someone and pay them so that like i hire a professional who knows what he's doing who has a business of it so i hired an immigration consultant down here in surrey okay so you said in surrey but i i, I didn't ask you so you are based in surrey so went to a consultant in surrey So let's let's use the word consultant we will not use the name so i don't want to malign anybody right, so sure. so he went to consultant and uh, he uh, you uh, he made an application for you for restoration on what date so he made an application on september 6th but i met him a day before like so i met him on september 5th i had a discussion with him he told me all the steps and he said like yeah he he, he knows about he knows about the process he knows what he's doing he has done this thing in the past so he told me like i mean he's pretty well educated on this process so i don't need to worry about anything and he told me like certain steps that i know now for sure they were they were totally wrong like whatever he told me was completely wrong but at the moment when he told me with all those with all those assurances with all those experience i thought he was he was what he was saying was right so i complied with what he was saying okay so there was a, there was a difference of opinion in between you and him about 
how much fees to pay and uh, and uh, you know uh, whether it requires any fees or not. So there was a, what what he said as he told me what he said that uh, you don't have to pay two hundred dollars. You said yes. You better check and it has to be paid. And he applied the restoration application without paying two hundred. Is that right? Right. So uh, do you mind if I explain you exactly what he said? Please, or? please, please go ahead. So I met him on September 5th. I asked him, so uh, this is this is what happened with my case. I for, uh, I uploaded my transcript, but they never got submitted. So I'm I'm on a restoration status right now. So I need to restore my legal status so that I could apply to start work from him. So in return, he told me that, oh, I'm well aware about this restoration process. Don't you don't have to worry about it because I've dealt with this case so many times in the past. So I know what I'm doing. So I asked him, like, could he describe me? What are the steps involved with it? So what he told me specifically was that it's nothing new. You just gotta reapply for your postcard work permit. But along with the postcard work permit, you gotta you gotta apply. Uh, you, you gotta also attach a letter of explanation. So the yeah. letter of explanation is gonna is gonna contain the reason why you went out of out of your status, why you weren't able to upload your transcripts in the first place. So that was pretty much it. And I asked him like, so how how did the letter of explanation work? He said. Well, for that, I would have, I mean, that letter of explanation has to be done by me because I'm a, cer I'm a certified immigration lawyer and I know what I'm doing. And that's the, that's the, that has to be done in a certain lawful language that I've studied, that I have a license for. And for that, you will have to pay me a thousand bucks. Okay. So that's pretty much it. He said, so we're going to pay the postcard work on fee. And uh, so you got to pay me the postcard work on fee. That's the 255 uh, $25, uh, dollars, and you need to pay $1,000 for the letter of explanation. So when I asked him, like, but my refusal letter specifically mentions that there's an applicable restoration fee. What about it? So he said, like, you don't have to pay that because for cases like you, like, you don't have to pay the restoration fee. And uh, just to double check it, I'll, uh, I'll have a word with IRCC over the phone. And by the time you come tomorrow on September 6th, uh, we'll be sure about it. So next day when I visited him, he told me the same thing. I had a word with IRCC. They said, you don't have to pay any kind of resolution fee for cases like this. All you have to do is pay the postcard work permit fee and attach a letter of explanation. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Okay. Right. Uh, obviously, so uh, he applied and uh, and he got a... He, uh, that application for restoration also was refused in around December, but he never told you or you asked him many times but he 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 did not let you know in time is that right yeah so i kept asking him like twice a month like i was out i i didn't knew like how this restoration process works so i didn't want to lose the grip on it the grip on my status so i wanted to ask him again and again so i kept asking him at least twice a month so so when i kept asking him in december and like i i know this thing for sure because it was my case. Like I was, I was pretty stressed about it. So I, the second last time I called him was somewhere in mid December, like 15, 16 December. I asked him if there's an update. He said there's no update. So the last time I called him was on 20, uh, 28th of December. I asked him if there was an update. He said like, no, there's no update. You gotta wait for completely four months because these kind of processes they take a minimum time period of four months. So I said okay. So the moment I hung up, like we, I hung up the phone. He calls me back after 10 minutes and says like, oh, I did a mistake. I asked him, what do you mean? And he said like, I forgot to check your update. We, uh, and I forgot to pay your restoration fee. I, I miscalculated your, I miscalculated your, your case file and IRCC gave me wrong instructions that uh, I don't have to pay any kind of restoration fee for your case. But uh, in reality, I was supposed to pay the restoration fee and I forgot to check your update because we re we received your refusal letter on December 12th, but I never checked it. I never checked your case. I never checked any update on your file. So I'm so sorry. Like I, I happened to check it right now when you called me. Okay. I was devastated after that. Okay. I've got it. So on, on December 12th, the restoration application itself is uh, denied uh, and uh, you are, you are out of luck on December 12th. Now remember, uh, just to be mindful of that your eligibility to apply for postgraduate work permit expired in, on November 15, 2019. So by December, you are out of luck for even your PG work permit and your restoration both at the same time, correct? Right. Okay. okay. So uh, on December 12th, it's refused and then he's talking to you and then uh, what was his plan of action? He went to a lawyer 
to discuss yeah. something. Tell me what happened there. So yeah, like so the moment he told me all those things, I was devastated. I I told him like, I'm I'm coming to your office right away. So we're gonna sit and talk about it because it, what you're telling me is not making any sense because you told me that you're an immigration lawyer and you told me you have dealt with cases like this in the past. So this thing doesn't add up at all because as if you're saying if you're telling me that you have dealt with several cases like this in the past, so you should know what you're doing. Like I mean, what you're telling me is like completely. I totally BS. Like, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So I went up to him. I saw him within like 30 minutes. I sat with him. He said, oh, I, do, I don't know what happened, but I don't know why IRCC would tell me that you don't have to pay, you don't have to pay the restoration fee. I said, like, there's no way IRCC would say that. But okay, uh, just forget about what happened. But you tell me what, what are you going to do to fix it? So he said, like, he knows a lawyer who would be, who would be down to fix it and who, has dealt with several complicated cases in the past, and I'm pretty sure he'd be able to fix it right away. So he said, like, you know what? Come to me tomorrow in the morning. We'll go. We'll go to his uh, go to his office first thing in the morning. I said, I don't think so. I have those kind of patients right now. So could you please take me to the lawyer right now because I'm I'm in I'm in a state of shock. So he talked for like a couple of minutes and he said, okay, you know what? Just hop in my car. Let's go to the lawyer. Unfortunately, I, I was in a state of panic, so I couldn't uh, I couldn't remember the name of the lawyer. I couldn't even remember like where he took me, but the, I I know the location, but I don't know his name. So he took me out there. We sat in his office. I explained the case, and w w when I was explaining, the lawyer he pretty much grasped the case within like five minutes, and he literally pointed up to the immigration to the consultant's face and said, "Look." I know or I know what you guys are talking about. It's pretty obvious that you did a mistake. He pointed it towards the consultant and said, it's you who did a big mistake. So you got to own up to it. So you got to give me an affidavit uh, claiming that you and your firm owns up to your mistake and you are, really, you are willingly helping this client of yours because you don't want him to lose his status or you don't want him to just go out of status or you don't want him to lose the eligibility of post work on So if you can provide me that affidavit, I'm going to take him to the border right, right away and we're going to do everything to fix it. So my uh, hang, on, hang on, hang on just a minute. I have to stop you here. Sure. Sure. So, uh, so the lawyer, so the lawyer tells you that if he, if he can own up to the mistake and give a self declaration that the mistake was, from the consultant side that the lawyer said that he can take this application to the border and fix it. Is that right? Right. That's what he told me. And, and I'm, and I'm wondering, I want you to ask the lawyer how, because here's, here's the problem because you are already out of status. Right. Uh, you are, you are ineligible for PG work permit and right. your, your restoration also 90 days. When did your 90 days for restoration uh, expire on December 3rd, I think, right? Yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. On December third. And today is December December twelfth or or December thirteenth. So how how on earth is the lawyer saying that he can get this fixed at the border? I am completely at the loss. Because uh there's no restoration application at the border for sure. There's right. no PG work permit application at the at the border. There's no HNC application at the border. What on earth was the lawyer thinking? Can can you just explain, uh, elaborate a little further? Uh, to be honest, I have no idea. All he told me was like he has to own up to his mistake, and we're gonna go there for something like let's say temporary resident permit or like some discretion from the officer. Like the officer would understand like the client that's me who did nothing wrong but trusted uh, an incompetent immigration consultant. So he needs to just provide some discretion and give me some sort of resort to restore my legal status or get into like either temporary resident permit or something that would make me eligible okay. to stay in Canada for a while. Okay, I've got it. So you you use the word uh, temporary resident permit. For people who don't understand temporary resident permit, let us uh, revisit uh, TRP just for a few seconds and see what is TRP and how, how can somebody suggest a TRP. Your temporary resident permit is issued to a foreign national who is inadmissible, who does not meet the requirements of AIRPA. But it is always issued at the discretion of uh, of the immigration officer and may be canceled at any time. But, uh, you know, what is the what is the factor that, that will uh, make them to issue the TRP, which is unclear, because uh, 
uh, you're clearly out of status. You not, uh, you know, uh, you did not follow the rules. Uh, somebody did not follow the rules. And is that a justification for TRP? I've never seen anything like it. Uh, that you know, this will give you a TRP. If I'm wrong, I need to be corrected. But I, I do not think that this itself, all the scenario, all the background information, it is not justifiable enough to issue a TRP, and let alone at the border. So I don't understand why somebody said TRP. They may be just uh, playing, you know, throwing darts in the darkness. So <clears throat> anyway, that's okay. But the but the consultant said that uh, he's not willing to own up to it, and that's it, and that's the end of the story. What did he do after after December 2019? So, like, uh, when we stepped out of, uh, so uh, before stepping out of the lawyer's office, he was kind of uh, skeptical about providing that effort. He said, like, you know what? He, he, I mean, he made a statement to the lawyer saying, like, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm a bit confused about providing that kind of effort. Like, I'm willing to help, help him, like me. He's willing to help me, but he don't, he doesn't feel too comfortable providing an effort of it, like that makes him owning up to his mistake. So he said, like, you know what? Just give me a day. Let me sleep over it. And I'll let you know by tomorrow morning as soon as possible. So the moment he said that and we stepped out, I was pretty sure he's not providing anything. So the moment we sat back in his car, he said, like, you know what? I know a bunch of other lawyers, so I'm going to talk to them and I'm going get, to get back to you. So in the meantime, just stay calm, stay in your house, make sure you don't get any uh, get involved in any kind of legal problems, stay away from uh, all the legal officers. But make sure you're safe enough so that you don't get caught by any kind of cop or anything like you know that will get you deported because you're out of status right now. So I'm gonna see what I could do. I have I have like, some I have some news for you just because I'm I'm doing research while I'm talking to you. Uh, okay. the TRP. <clears throat> the lawyer said that he can he mentioned it or maybe referred it to TRP at the border. That is not going to happen. Uh, you cannot have uh, your temporary resident status within the, the uh, $200 restoration status than at the, than at the airport at all. So TRP does not solve that problem at all. So I, I, I hope you understand and people who are listening to this to understand. Uh, uh, TRP does not uh, get you the temporary resident status if you are already in that 90-day restoration period. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, like to be honest, like I didn't have much knowledge about it, so that was that was a part of the reason why I was hiring an immigration consultant in the first place. So, like, I had no clue what to do after knowing this thing, like that I've got another refusal because I was already like first of all I was devastated. Then after that, like since I didn't have no information about restoration, no knowledge about restoration, let alone restoration, I had no knowledge about what to do next because. I didn't. I didn't knew like. I mean, what's gonna happen? Because I could not afford to go back with nothing in my hand. Like, I, I, back with... I understand. I understand. I just. I just want you to fill in some gap by giving you some uh, legal insight on, on what is the TRP, what is the inadmissibility, and whether it can be given uh, to people on the border or, or it does it confer any temporary resident status. So, uh, I'm just going to read something on. I have some everything in the, on people's the screen. I'm showing it to. Uh, just read it, read it out to you. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> when a student is is uh, when a student who has a valid temporary uh, resident status, uh, if if he is deemed inadmissible, they have to write a subsection A44 report. This is called an inadmissibility report. Unless the report is written up by the immigration, which, which in case in your case it did not uh, was not written. Uh, you are not eligible. You are not even eligible to apply for temporary resident permit, and TRP is not required. Do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe I'm just repeat one more time. So your application was refused. Uh, your restoration application was refused. That does not make you inadmissible. And since you are not inadmissible, a TRP should not be done and is not required. So anybody who was mentioning TRP, uh, they are they are they do not understand the law. Do you, do you understand? So yeah. the, the TRP should not even have been mentioned or discussed at all at, at this point because uh, a subsection A44 admissibility report was never made uh, against you by the immigration in the, all the refusal letters. Yeah, go ahead. What happened later on? Nothing. Like, I mean, I was clueless. Like, I mean, anywhere I would go, like, first of all, like, since I was out of status, uh, I had no source of income and there were some problems going back home. So. I, I didn't have no means to communicate back to my parents to ask for some kind of financial help. So I was kind of left like, 
like I was bounded to do everything by myself because if I try to hire any kind of new new lawyer or an immigration consultant, I was pay, supposed to pay them something. But since I was like out of my job, I didn't have no source of income. I didn't have much money to hire a new lawyer. So I had to do something by myself. And the last thing that I heard from the lawyer was a TRP. So I did my own research and applied for a TRP by myself. And of course, like since I'm doing it by myself, I don't know. Like okay, I, when, I did. when did you apply for TRP? What date? So I applied for TRP on January 4th, 2020. January 4th, 2020, you applied and it was refused on what date? Uh, August 12th, 2020. August 12th, 2020. And uh, can you tell me what was the reason uh, written on the refusal letter? Or do you want me to read it out or just tell please, you? Like, please it? read it out. Please read it out. Uh, just give me one sec. I'll take it out real quick. Um, it's all the way down in the middle, so it's, just give me one minute. If you don't they don't have it, that's fine. That I I understand, the, but just give me the just one line, whatever you remember. Yeah, like they pretty much say like uh, the immigration cons uh, the immigration lawyer, uh, I mean the immigration officer. He had looked at all my documents and he's not satisfied with my with all the documents that I've provided and he doesn't feel I'm fit like I fit the eligibility to receive a TRP. So therefore, my TRP or like uh, or visa record has been refused. Okay, good. So uh, this was refused on August 12th, and now it is refused. And they also ask you in the letter, I think, uh, that you should leave Canada immediately. Is that right? Right. <clears throat> okay. And uh, this was on August 12th, so they ask you to leave Canada because you have no status, you have no PG work permit, you have no restoration, you have no TRP, nothing. You have this, just zip, nada, nothing. And then uh, uh, they ask you to leave, and but uh, you decided not to not to go back to India. What? A, uh, what 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 are the things uh, that happened after August 12? You went to a member of parliament in Surrey, and then did they help you? What did the member of parliament say to your uh, to your application status? Then? So, so yeah, but like I mean, before that, I also did file a complaint against the consultant to ICCRC. Do you want me to mention that, or is that mm -hmm. okay? I don't mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mean, like as I told you, like since I applied a TRP by myself on January 4th. Uh, I, I had nothing to do. Like I was clueless. I was just hitting my head like here and there on different walls and just trying to figure out what to do. And like this COVID-19 thing was emerging. So I was just sitting by myself. I had no for, uh, no sources. So what I did, I started reading stuff online about I IRCC and ICCRC, like okay. the RCIC professional misconduct, the complaint procedures. So yeah. I started reading that and I found out like, I mean, if an immigration consultant, he does a mistake or he, he provides some incompetent advice or he re represents in an incompetent way, I mean, you could file, you could file a complaint against him. So that's, that's something that I found. Let me, I, let me ask you, let me ask you first, uh, uh, before you, before you, uh, you filed the ICCRC complaint, I did not ask you and I should ask you now that uh, to the consultant, did they give you uh, how much fees they charge you in total? And do you have receipts of the money that, that they that was paid? Yeah, I, I have an online receipt. So it's uh, I paid him like, uh, so like the letter of explanation was thousand bucks, but he made it, he made an agreement that I got to pay him like 500 bucks before applying and 500 bucks once I received the postcard work permit, which I never received. So I paid him 500 bucks for the letter of explanation and 255 bucks for the postcard work the open work All right. So did, did you have a retainer agreement from the consultant? That's something that I know that I signed a bunch of papers, but he never gave it to me. Okay. I have so, been asking. Yeah. So you you don't you signed some papers, but you have no copy of retainer agreement from the from the consultant. No, I, okay. I asked him a bunch of times, but he never gave it to me. He's not responding back to me. I'm I'm trying to get in touch with him again and again. Like I tried calling him twice. But his uh, his receptionist, she's been saying, okay, you know what? Uh, yeah, we would have a routine argument, uh, but give me a day, I'll get back to you tomorrow. I'll get back to you tomorrow. But they never get back to me. So okay, this is still... this is something that this is something I want you to let a lot of people know is that whenever, whenever in life, whenever you hire immigration consultant or immigration lawyer in Canada, uh, who's licensed, who's authorized, uh, 
these things are absolutely mandatory. You need to get a written agreement from the consultant specifying what is being done, what is the application, how much is the cost, what will you do, what will you do, blah, blah, blah. There are a lot of things in the in the agreement. And it, it will have the signature of the client so that you, the client understands, you know, you agree to these terms and conditions. So everybody should have the written retainer agreement. Everybody should have the proof of money paid if you paid by online check or cash or whatever. You need to have proof. These two things are absolutely non-negotiable. Without, because whenever you file a complaint to ICCRC, they will ask you these things and say, hey, I don't have it. And say, we don't know what was agreed. And say, he said something, you said something, we don't know what we said something on the phone. Nobody remembers anything now after one year. And without a written agreement, absolutely clueless. So everybody should have a written agreement. Anyway, so you filed a complaint with ICCRC. And what did the ICCRC tell you? And what are they saying? What is happening to the complaint now? Well, I mean, since, you know, like this pandemic uh, hit it, yeah, I mean, it did start in March, and I filed my complaint in uh, on March 5th. So it's still ongoing. Like, I mean, I'm still waiting for for an answer for them because I'm just confused because like it's uh, it has been uh, forwarded up to the early resolution program, and from there it's being processed up to case review right now. Like, so presently my complaint is going through the case review process. Yeah, so they, they may take time. They are not in a hurry, of course. Uh, depending on how urgent they look at the complaint, they may they may take six months, one year. Who knows what happens? So that will continue on. Are you demanding any money from the consultant? What are you demanding? What what is your resolution on? What is what are you demanding from the consultant? Well, um, to be honest, I want to I do want to demand, but I don't know what's the exact number I should demand because uh, I got certain doubts in my head right now because as you said, like the retainer agreement is something that's important. But he never gave it to me. But at the end of the day, he can never back out because uh, when I had a word with IRCC over phone, they did tell me that, yeah, you have the second refusal for your postcard work permit. Yeah, we know that. And it also mentions that you do have a representative. By that, by, uh, I mean, that consultant is your representative. It's it's online. I mean, it's everywhere on, uh, on IRCC or my GCT. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that complaint is ongoing. And... Uh... You lost your job. You have no money. You are uh, uh, you are without any job. But tell me how how is your life? How are you coping up? What what are you thinking? And how does your family is thinking about all this? It's pretty devastating. So it's pretty much like just because he forgot or he just miscalculated my case and he he never paid those two hundred bucks. I I forced like I forced him to look over it three times. I told him like it does mention the applicable resolution fee, but he kept saying me to one thing that I did have a phone I did have a phone call, call conversation with IRCC and they said like no you don't have to pay for it you don't have to pay for cases like this so I said okay like I mean you have a business running down for 10 years you're telling me you have, you had a word with IRCC so okay I take your word for it I get it like I mean you you're my, you're representing me if you I don't think so you'll mess up because you're saying like you have done this thing in the past so I had no clue so I just I, it, it just it's just pretty saddening because just because he forgot to pay those 200 bucks my whole three years that I struggled for like it's 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 pretty devastating so it's it's like I have paid more than eighty or ninety thousand dollars in those three years because you know tuitions for international students it's not it's not cheap it's it's so expensive out here so for one semester I was paying I was a full-time student all six semesters so for one semester I was paying somewhere from seven thousand to eight thousand dollars of a semester, so it was pretty much twenty-four thousand uh, dollars a year. Yeah. So uh, you said something about that the consultant talked to the IRCC about whether fees is required or not, and IRCC gave him some advice on the phone. I wanted to let you know and other people who are listening and to know that IRCC is not in the business of giving advice to you on the phone. Obviously. You know, you are not talking to an immigration officer on the phone. You're talking to a call center representative who is working at the call center, contact center, immigration. They are not immigration officers. They are not lawyers. They are not, uh, you know, delegated, uh, you know, uh, decision makers uh, that they can decide. And you do not know the name. You do not know nothing. Any conversation with the immigration on the phone, this is not immigration advice. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, there, there's no proof, there's no evidence who said what what was said and, and why it was said. So this is absolutely baseless. 
that somebody in immigration told me something on the phone and that's why I did something. This is, this is not the way immigration works. I know, like, that's something that I know right now is not true. Like, I mean, I could, I could tell this thing that he was just lying straight up on it, like, straight up on my face that he had a where we are, CC. And, it, like, to be honest, in the first, like, IRCC, like, even if you call them, they would never give any kind of suggestion like this in the first place. Because if you have a refusal letter saying a restoration and it mentions the applicable restoration fee, you have to pay it regardless. Like, I mean, there's no way or there's no chance in the world that IRCC over a phone would tell you that you don't have to pay for cases like this. This, well, this thing doesn't add up at all. Well, what, what IRCC does is this. Look, and uh, I, I know because I, I used to call, uh, I don't call them anymore. Uh, what they what they will do is they will only send you an email link through the website. They will show you on the website. They will say go to the website and read about it. That's it. Uh, they will not say anything from their own side. There's no private conversation with them. There's nothing uh, you know any strategic speaker advice that they can give you on the phone. Uh, that will not happen. So it's just anything whatever is listed on their website. They will email you the forms and the guides. That's it. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so that is done. So. Uh, Right now, you, right now you are illegal. Right now you are out of status. Uh, you have no status. You have no work permit. You have nothing. What is your future plans now? What are you trying to do now? Hey, honestly, like I finished my associate of science. My main goal was to be a doctor. I wanted to study like medicine out here. That was my main goal. Like the only reason I was applying for the postcard work permit was so that like I could save up some money and so that I could use the same money in my in my tuitions again. So that I could finish my bachelor's and master's. That was my main goal. Like I wanted to study further. That was my ultimate goal to just be here. But I didn't know like I mean hiring an incompetent immigration consultant would get me up here. Like I mean there was no way or there was no screen that I could have detected. Like I mean yeah this lawyer or this consultant he's he's not competent enough. Like he's giving a wrongful advice. So I did my best what I could do. The best thing I could do was just get an advice and pay him and that's what i yeah. did but i never knew like what, what i mean i i there was no way i could i could have screened him off but yeah he's lying to me or he's just trying to earn something off me or he's just trying to make a client he's just trying to add up add me to one of his client lists so that he could have his bank account raised up it doesn't like i had no like okay. no clue to detect that right uh, so, unfortunately you know unfortunately and unluckily actually if you look uh you had 90 days i'm sorry you had 180 days to apply for PG work permit. You right. could have applied to work permit uh, till about November 15th. You were right. first you were first refused on uh, September uh, May, uh, yeah September 3rd September. So at, after September 3rd, uh, you chose to get yourself restored, and I think that was a risky application to get it restored into study permit status was and then go for because. Eventually, if, even if you had restored uh, yourself to study permit status, you would have exceeded the November 15 deadline to qualify for PG work permit. And if you came to me at that time, look, either, you know, if you came to me on September 3rd or, uh, you know, uh, before November, I would have said, look, you have 10 days or 20 days left to qualify for PG work permit. The only way to get the PG work permit is you have to leave Canada. You can go to India, you can go to America, you can go outside Canada, and you could have applied for post-graduation work permit from overseas. As soon as you leave Canada, then that uh, uh, illegal status or restoration status problem goes away immediately. Then that means you are outside Canada. You know, there's no need to restore. And then you could have applied for a post-graduate work permit from also from for example, if you were in India, you could have applied from New Delhi and you would have got, because you have the graduation certificate, you have the graduation transcripts, you have everything, and you are well within November 15 deadline. Even if you had applied on November 14, they would have taken an application and you would have got your post-graduation work visa from the New Delhi and came back again, and then you would have got it. So that would have the, been the best advice I, I must have, I should have given you if you came to me. but. It's all in the history now. There's nothing you know you can do to retrace back your uh, your history. Uh, so, I wish I knew yeah, so right I wish. right now right now based on all this, uh, you know, uh, what what is something that you learn? What is something that you uh, you know people should learn is uh, you should always do research 
about the law, no matter what, whatever application, whether it's a simple application or you know complex application, you must always read up, you must read the guides, you must understand what the law is, what the application is, what are the factors. And then uh, if you're not sure, then you, you have to go and take help from some consultant. Of course, in your case, you did, but unluckily it didn't work out. So, uh, you know, uh, the more homework that you do on your own application, the better chance that you get a consultant that understands and uh, there will not be any mistakes. So that's all I can say. But at this point of time, the longer you are in Canada, you are you are prolonging your illegal status. My advice is to go back, uh, you know, go back to your home country uh, and leave Canada because uh, I think you you told me earlier that somebody somebody said to you that uh, you know uh, you are living here. Maybe it will maybe somehow your your fortunes will turn and soon enough you will qualify for PR. I want to mention this clearly uh, through the law is that the longer you are continuing here as an illegal status, uh, there is no restoration for you. Uh, and uh, you will you will not qualify for any PR status uh, at all. Uh, you know, you don't have the qualification. You, you don't get to get express entry. Even if you have a job offer, they will not approve a work permit based on LMIA for you. Uh, you will not get the PNP. Uh, you will not file for refugee. You will not file for study, nothing. There is no visa. There's nothing that you can do today that will reverse your fortunes in Canada as far as the law is concerned. Uh, and uh, you should you should return to your home country and uh, start your life afresh. That's the best advice I can give you. Uh, and um, if you want to study, I know you want to study further beyond your uh, associate degree. Maybe you want to complete a full uh, degree program eventually or something. My best advice is that you should go back to your home country, uh, you know, take admission for study visa, perhaps in September 2021. Uh, make sure that you are going to a good university, good uh, program. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have the ILTS and you have the money and everything. You have to start afresh for a study visa. There is no guarantee uh, that uh, the visa officer sitting in the Canadian High Commission, New Delhi, will give you the visa. Uh, because they will look at the case uh, just like we are, you know, the whole scenario and decide what is the chance that, you know, you will stay in status and you will not violate any law and then make a decision uh, again and that that's how it will go. So uh, if you get the study visa, then you have to start your life again, just like what you did for a few years. And then uh, hopefully, you know, maybe you'll not make a mistake again in the future. That's all I can say. But uh, to emphasize, you must leave Canada as soon as you can. Honestly, um, that's what I'm working on right now. I'm just wrapping up everything. I've had like most of my stuff. I'm just ready to leave. I'm just waiting for things to calm down back in India because there's a lot of chaos going down right now because of the protests out there. So that's what I'm waiting on to calm down because it's, uh, from what I've heard, my family's been telling me it's it's a bit of a chaos out there, and there 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 are ways that have been blocked. So there, I don't think so. I have a a designated way that I'd be able to go back to my place. So I just got to wait for things to calm down for a bit. I have, I've packed up pretty much everything last night. Like, I mean, after having a word with you and when you told me everything, so I did pack up pretty much everything, but I'm just, I'm just hoping for the best that like my, my ICCRC complaint, it, it comes to, they understand my case and like something goes in my favor because it's, it's been a, it's been a, one of the biggest hiccup of my life, I guess. It's it's been pretty devastating, like situ situation and experience for me this whole 2020. I had to go through a lot just because I had someone who who didn't knew what he was doing, but he was giving me all those fake assurances, and I I didn't even like till today. I'm not able to understand what did I do wrong exactly because like I hired someone because i didn't have no knowledge like and i i thought like he has the knowledge that's why he has a business so that's what i'm still confused where did i actually go wrong yeah uh <clears throat> you know unfortunately uh these professional mistakes can be done by anybody in any profession anybody. you know even doctors make mistakes lawyers make mistakes accountants make mistakes you know you go to a dentist sometimes they do a wrong surgery on you or maybe they leave some gap in your tooth or something Anybody can make mistakes. The more homework that you do in that profession for whatever application that you are trying to do, 
the better chances that you will find the right profession. And always have to go around and talk to people. A lot of people, for example, come to me and you know, and they say, hey, uh, I want you to do this, this application, you know, that application, whatever, and I'll pay you thousand dollars, two thousand, whatever, and say, look, I'm not interested in the money, but I want you to understand the application first, and we will do a consultation session for one hour or something. I'll charge you money, of course, but I will talk and discuss the application with you so that you are on the same level. So you understand what is the law and what, what to do, what not to do, what documents are needed. And you know, the more research and more homework we do on, on the situation, the client is empowered and you know, the more chances are we will uh, eliminate those mistakes. That's all, that's all it is. Otherwise, if you jump right in and say, hey, consultant, hey, lawyer, take this money and do the application for me, you know, who knows uh, what will happen? And, you know, just in your case, uh, if the mistakes come up, these mistakes are irreversible. They are fatal mistakes and this will screw up your life big time. That's all that's I can say. Freedom. So everybody has to you know, uh, do a little homework before any application. I mean, these applications look like simple applications. I you know what permitted application is not a complex application, but even in simple application, uh, if you did not calculate the right fee, it will screw up the whole thing, and which it did, of course, in your case. So uh, uh, that's that's right. Uh, you have any questions for me? You can ask any question uh, before we go. Yeah, I got, I got like a couple of questions there, guys. So, go okay, ahead. what do you think? What are the chances for IRCC to conduct the complaint in my favor? Because I really need that. Because in order for me to apply for the September intake, then if that ICCRC complaint has to go in my favor, because if that goes in my favor, like the, I think the embassy would be able to recognize like the reason for me to stay out there was just pretty, like pretty obvious, I guess. I yeah. don't know, like. What yeah, do you think? there's a good chance. There's a good chance it will go in your favor, but I cannot predict how long will it take. Whether it takes six months, one year, or longer, there's no there's no way for me to predict. All you can do is you can send an email to ICCRC and saying, look, I'm in a little time bind here. I got to leave the country, so if you can just expire the thing, I would appreciate it. And uh, that's all you can say. And then I've you done know. it a bunch of times. I've done it. Like I've dropped them emails so many times, but the only the only response that I've got from them is that well, ICCRC is working on it, and because of this ongoing pandemic situation, uh, things are uh, things are being a bit slower. So you got the only thing you could do is wait. That's the only response I've got. I've dropped them email five times, but that's the only response that I've got. But my major concern is that. Since my consultant, he is not he's not providing, he's not answering me regarding the retainer agreement, like the that agreement that I signed, he's not answering me. Would do you think would that be a problem? Like if they ask me for like uh, could he provide us a retainer agreement? Because in, in those documents I have provided the receipts and my email conversation, like that email thread that I had with him. I have provided that uh, that as an evidence in documents, but the only thing that I'm missing is the retainer agreement because he yeah, never they will, provided the one. they will find, they will get it uh, directly from him. So if 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 you're not getting it, that's we okay. don't don't tense your mind about it. They will uh, they will get this uh, on on their own uh, from the consultant right. Okay, then then I think yeah, I mean I'm pretty sure like then it should possibly like, it should go in my favor because. I I did everything right in, in the right order, I guess. Like so, okay. So I got second question for you, if you don't mind. Please. So, uh, like when I was working here, I was also volunteering. Like I was I was voluntarily working somewhere else. Like I was just providing my volunteer hours to uh, to an SRO. Uh, so the employer, like my employer, said like she, she's ready to sponsor me. Like she she is happy with my volunteer work and she's ready to sponsor me to stay in. So do you think like that sponsorship, that LMIA could work somehow? Like if I go back to India and reapply it and do something? It may, it, 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 it may, uh, there, but there's no guarantee that, you know, uh, you know, they will, uh, they will give you the work visa. You, if they, if the employer gives you LMIA and then you can apply for work visa from India and then uh, uh, the visa officer will decide whether they should give it to you depending on the situation, the job offer and uh, whether it balances uh the uh, you know the requirement for you to be in canada so um sure uh you know you can give it a try why not so what you're saying is like so if i go back to india can i apply right away or, or no, should i still, no, still I, wait for like five no, six I, months i i think I, I told you earlier also uh i don't think you should apply right away you should give it a give it a break for a few months because okay. it does not make sense to fly to india and then apply for the visa after a few days that does not make sense 
So I think I, if I were you, I would just wait out, wait it out for at least three to four months. Yeah, of course. Like I was just uh, trying to make sure because, like, I mean, even if if I go back to India, like, even if I provide, even if I try to go for my sponsorship, this LMIA thing, I think I still need to do the IELTS exam, right? Well, that depends on the job offer. I mean, you can you they can do the LMIE application right now. They don't have to wait for you to go to India. They can do the LMIE application. LMIE may take two months, three months, and uh, they, whenever the LMIE is approved, that will again uh, stay valid for close to up to even six months. So you have enough time. They don't have to wait for you to fly out before they do the LMIE. They can do the LMIE application today. But isn't it, isn't it like I mean, I need a legal status for that to be approved? No, no. The LMIE is LMIE is not about you. The LMIE is about the job. So the LMIE is about the company and the job offer. It's not about you. Uh, like as I said, like I don't have much knowledge about it. So that's well, why well, that's, why, that's why you need, you need to go to an immigration lawyer to talk to about uh, who, who will do the LMIE and what is what goes on the LMIE. If the LMIE is being done by the employer, so the employer yeah. will hire an immigration lawyer. So maybe you should ask them who's the immigration lawyer who will do the LMIE. And then you should take an appointment with the lawyer to discuss uh, what goes on in the LMIE. But ultimately, the employer pays for it, and uh, the employer is responsible for it. So it has nothing to do with you. Well, yeah, like my employer, like I mean, my like I mean, uh, this employer, she's been telling me like if you like if your thing gets sorted out or if it doesn't get sorted out, let me know. I can book an appointment with my immigration lawyer. He could sit and talk to you, and you guys could discuss because. I really don't have time to just sit with you, so yeah. you can just let me know. Take the offer. Take the offer and go and uh, go and talk to him then. Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah, that was something in my head like for quite a bit because like I wanted to clear that thing from you especially because it's been a while. Like I've been seeing different consultants and like the first thing that I that I hear from them is like, yeah, this is how much they're gonna charge me for this this thing. So. I was a bit skeptical, so I ran into one of your YouTube videos, so that kind of made me determined to just get in touch with you. But yeah. yeah, but LMIA, LMIA, but just to summarize the LMIA, LMIA can be done independently of you. Uh, the LMIA is a, is an application that will certify that the job is, uh, is available, uh, but there are no Canadian citizens and residents who are willing to apply, and this job should be uh, you know, can be used to requisition a foreign employee like you. Or if you if you don't get the visa, if they have the LMIA, they can even bring a second person from there. So they can always get this name changed. LMIA is an is a decision about the company and the job. It is not a com it is not a decision about Rahul. Okay, okay, okay. Makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Wow. It's been a crazy way for me, buddy, to be is honest. There, like, is, there any, is there any advice? Uh, there are a lot of uh, students in Canada, in Surrey, in Vancouver, everywhere. Uh, is there any advice that you want to give to other students who are right now studying or in the process of graduating from the college and applying for PG work permit? Well, I would say, first of all, do your homework. Make sure you do your own research first. And then if you're, if you're going up to one consultant, make sure that's not the one you stick to. You just do your, your own homework you do your own research you, if you're trying to hire a consultant make sure you try to get in touch with various different consultants you try to get like knowledge from not just one consultant but at least two or three of them i would say especially like, i would say like get, get the knowledge from you rather than just getting it from someone else out there but yeah if you're trying to hire a consultant you better make sure like you, you at least get or at least, at least you get the consultation from two or three different consultants, not just one person. You know, this gives me this gives me an example of a, of a going to a doctor. If you have a problem, a medical problem, you go to one doctor. If you don't like the advice, you go to a second doctor. You go to the third doctor. You take a second opinion, and you know you compare right. what is as you as you choose a doctor. Why not choose an immigration consultant by comparing? That's always a good idea. Right. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean th that thing makes sense a lot. Like. But yeah, I, I, to be honest, like, I mean, I should have done that too, but I, I thought like, yeah, honestly, I went with the online reviews. Like I saw like the person has like pretty decent online reviews. So yeah, I mean, he, what he's saying must be true because the way he's talking to me and the kind of confidence he has, yeah, why not? So yeah, I went sometimes, with him. sometimes these yeah. reviews can be manipulated. These reviews on the Google review or other website, I mean, they are not real reviews. Uh, sometimes uh, reviews can be can be you know played around. Actually, I mean uh, I I don't I don't believe on the reviews. I mean, especially when I, I I can tell you that in my case when I 
when I talk to a doctor or anybody, you know, like a professional, you know, I don't look at the reviews. I like to, you know, talk to the professional and get my own inner feeling on, you know, how how does it look like, uh, and then um, you know, uh, then then we right. decide because these reviews may not be true. Yeah, I mean, I should have stick to that kind of thing. Like I should have wait, like I should have kind of sensed, like I should have kind of leaned towards my gut feeling because when I was telling him again and again by the resolution fee. I was kind of a bit like skeptical again and again, so that was a part of a region I kept mentioning again and again about the resolution fee. So, but I let's say like I was lazy enough because I was working like pretty hard. I was working crazy amount of hours, like 40 to 60 hours a week. So I thought like I mean, if he's saying it has to be true because he has a business, he's been running for 10 years. I don't need to go to any other consultant, so he must be right. Um, so, like, I, I accepted that I was probably being lazy, but again, like, I don't think so that being being this lazy should have been punished this hard. Yeah. Like, this okay. really went tough for me. Okay. Hey, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and for contribution to help uh, spread awareness. Uh, yeah. And I wish you uh, good luck and, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, wish things, so. I wish things will uh, uh, your for your your uh, you know faithful reverse back uh, if you want to still come to Canada maybe some some things will happen but you know you might uh, have to just delay a little bit but uh, going leaving Canada is is uh, non-negotiable you have to leave Canada. Yeah, I mean like that's the only thing I'm relying on. I really need the luck to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was nice talking to you, buddy. It was really nice talking to you. You, you really opened my eyes to like a certain limit that I could actually see like going back in is but is the best decision for me right now. Okay. Thank you so much, buddy. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Bye. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay in touch with you. By the way, I'll sure. stay in touch with you because like I want I want to get back here in September, so I'll stay in touch with you. Sure. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much, buddy. You have a nice day. Bye.